every dimension you add will increase one more factor of n to your running time. For any interesting problem you want to solve, and for any interesting resource that you want to optimize. And again, this is of course like all general principles. There are counterexamples. This is not always true in all cases. But it's mostly true in most cases. <laughs> That's why it's a principle. So if you're dealing with some data and you start throwing in more information, there is a price you're going to pay for doing so. And it is dealing with that price, not about the size of the data, but the dimension of the data, which is the topic of today's lesson. So that's sort of the overview of what I want to talk about, right? And this is the, the, sort of the, the, the dual, if you were, so the flip side of the challenge from previous lecture. Where right there we were trying to squash data to make it smaller. Here we're trying to squash the dimensions to make them small. So let me give you, let me start with a very simple example of a problem that you know, may have nothing to do with any kind of data, but it's but an illustration of the underlying geometric complexity of these questions. And we'll look at a very simple question, um, a question you may or may not have seen before. It's called convex hull. So, um, no. okay. How many of you have heard of convex hull? Show of hands. People, people up in, people up in ski definitely have heard of it. Yeah, other ways. Okay. So, the convex hull of a set of points is a fancy name for the following idea. So I take, let's say a bunch of points in the plane. Okay, so I'm gonna draw a bunch of points in the plane. Let's say they're here, here, here. Okay. One way to describe the convex hull, which is not maybe mathematically the best way to do it, but it's the most easy to understand, is to say, think of these points as really nails on a board that I nailed in, so they're about a little yay high on, on the board. So I take my, gigantic rubber band, stretch it over the points and let it go. So it's going to, you know, sort of wrap itself around them, right? And if it wraps itself around them, it's going to look something like this. Right? If you took a gigantic rubber band and let it go. This object right here is called the convex hull. Okay. Now it's called a hull because kind of like a ship's hull. It's on the outside. It's called a convex hull because the other way to describe the set, which is a more maybe mathematically rigorous way of defining it, is that so the convex hull of a point set P is the smallest <coughs> convex set that contains P. Okay? So of course the convex set is kind of round, it doesn't have little knobbly things in it, little dents in it. Again, I can define that more formally, but just visualize the convex set that way. Right? Any, more, any two points in the interior of a convex set that draw a straight line between them will also stay in the set. So this is the smallest such convex set. And you can show that if your set consisted of a set of points, then the convex set will be a polygon. Convex hull will be a polygon. It won't be something weird. It won't have curves. It will be this bunch of straight lines. Okay? So is the definition of a convex hull here? So it's a convex hull is a very basic primitive in computational geometry. But again, if you um, take the class in, the, in geometry, you'll come across this. It's, you can think of it like sorting almost. Right? That you sort of, one, way of, one way of thinking about sorting a bunch of points is to compute the convex hull and just look around the boundary. Or the boundary is like a boundary. Think of it like a, a generalization of a boundary box. Instead of just a rectangle, you have a much more precise fit. Okay. So it's a very basic structure in, in geometry. And one thing you like to ask with these objects is how big are they? If I have a set of points of size n, how big can the convex hull be? Well, it should be pretty clear that, you know, since the convex hull of points in two dimensions is a polygon, which I asserted, and if there are n points, the convex hull of a set of points is at most n. Right? So, so the convex hull of P is of size O of n in 2 okay. It's not going to be more than that. Yes? Size of convex hull means number of points in there? Good question. Good question. When I say the size of convex hull, what I mean is 
the complexity of the description of the hull, which means the points and the connections. In this case, it's easy. I can just give it an ordered set of points. So every point connects to the next one. But in general, I have to say, okay, here are the points, here are the edges. Convex are in itself in a set, right? Um, it's the boundary. You can okay, so you can think of the okay, so you can think of the convex hull, depending how you define either as the set itself or as the boundary of the set. I'm thinking of the boundary of the set. Because the boundary defines the set also, right? You can just check. The number of points on the boundary is n points. The number of points plus the number of edges. Okay. Because it's a cycle. They're the same thing. That's why I put the whole thing as an extra point. Okay? So you need that much information to describe the convex hull completely. You need to know which points on the boundary, and you need to know how that comes <coughs> Okay, so what happens if I think of this in three dimensions now? So now, again, I have a collection of points. You can now think of instead of a rubber band, I have a rubber sheet. I take this big rubber sheet, and I let it go, and it kind of sort of wraps itself. In fact, the algorithm, one of the algorithms for computing convex hull is called a gift wrapping algorithm. So it gift wraps itself are all the points, right? And um, you get something. While it's not obvious, again, it's, you can show that what you get is what is called a polyhedron. Right? It's just a simple polyhedron in three dimensions. And it's like, of course, going to be convex. Right? And what's even less obvious, but can be shown, is that the complexity of this polyhedron is also linear. And if you're wondering why that's true, there are many ways to show this. One way is to realize that any polyhedron in, uh, any polyhedron in three dimensions is really the same as a planar graph. Every planar graph is only you know, a linear number of edges, faces, and vertices, and that's one proof. There are other ways you can prove this. But it's not obvious, but you can, you can show it. And so if I now write down convex hull of a set of points in 3D, it is again going to be O of n. Of course, if you're prone to extrapolating from a pattern like this, you'll say, oh, great, it's always linear sized. <laughs> of course, it's not. And you don't need one more example of it. If I now ask what happens to points in 4D, and this is a bit harder to visualize again, so it's, I'm, you know, it's going to be hard to see what it looks like. But you can show that the convex hull of points in 4D, and again, now you have to be careful. In 3D, I'm describing not just the points. I have the points, I have, tri I have faces, and I have edges. So I have to describe three things there. Right? Which are the points, which are the edges, and which are the faces. In 4D, you need points, edges, faces, and three-dimensional faces. And it turns out this is going to be okay. You can do this again in 5D. And again, I'm not talking about the algorithms right now. I just want to talk about the com the combinatorial complexity of this object. It'll be and now, of course, if you're prone to looking at patterns, you might propose a new pattern. But this time, you'll be right. <laughs> The pattern is that the convex hull <coughs> in D dimensions is It's not n. It's much, much larger. This is a, a very cool uh, fact. Um, this is also called the upper bond theorem, which is proved in the, uh, I think, in the 70s. Um, it's not at all easy to prove. Uh, but there is a, there's a famous paper that proves that the number of points in that hall, not the whole the number of points, is, is basically this number. And the whole proof of that result is in the abstract of the paper. <laughs> it's kind of those nice papers. The, the, the entire result is in the abstract, two lines. You can prove this. It's not easy, but it, it is been written shortly. Uh, and what's more interesting is that this is tight. There is an example. So the example of this is what you do is you. So the, so the tight example, which means an example where you actually have to pay that much complexity to get the convex hull, um, choose 
endpoints along a main curve. So the curve is basically f of t is equal to t con t squared con t cubed con to t to the t. So in other words, a curve is a mapping from uh, a single parameter t to some set of points in space. Because if you think of the curve in time, you just kind of trace out a point in space. So if you choose your, your, your range of this function to be a d-dimensional space, that, that function you've written on that, it forms a kind of a curve. It's called a moment curve. Okay? And uh, of course, if it's just two dimensions, it's kind of like a parallel, right? You're saying that you have x and you have x squared. And if you have three dimensions, x, you know, x, x squared, x cubed, and so on. And so if you now pick any points, any endpoints on the set, it doesn't really matter. Just pick endpoints for n different values of t and try to compute the convex hull. It will actually give you that type. Again, this is a non-trivial result. It's kind of cool that you can prove that. I'm not going to talk about that. But the point remains that this convex hull, this simple object that describes the boundary of a shape, has complexity that depends exponentially on the dimension. And in fact, almost any interesting shape you might think about computing in geometry. Um, there are things called Warner diagrams, the line triangles, they're all kind of related and there are other structures like that. They all depend exponentially on the dimension. So you know, again, I'm going to state this as a general principle, not as a theorem, because it's, there are obviously counterexamples. Now, of course, the way to make this the theorem is to say, well, if your structure doesn't grow exponentially with D, it can't be that interesting in the first place. So therefore, this makes this true. <laughs> and, the, you know, if you think about this, right, so if you think about, well, you know, maybe it's not so bad, maybe D is not that big. If you ever dealt with any kind of data problem, you'll realize that, you know, very quickly you're dealing with 100-dimensional data. So you have a thousand, you have a, a million points in 100 dimensions, and you've got to do something with it. So, you know, if you now start calculating things like, okay, what is 10 to the 6? to the power of 100. This is not going anywhere. <laughs> there is nothing you can do to actually compute these things. They're basically in trouble. So you, you are forced, essentially, by the nature of your dimensionality with data and the size of the data. Not that if this was 1,000, you'd be much happier. <coughs> to do something different. To change the way you ask these questions. And the first moral of the story is don't compute convex hulls. Find something else to compute. Use that as, as your interesting thing. Don't, don't compute these weird exact structures. And again, as, as should not be surprising to you now, if you want to define approximate versions of these things, there are lots of things you can do. So you can make approximations to try and make your complexity smaller. But that won't really change the fundamental dimensionality of your problem. So for example, last time we talked about computing diameter of a point set. Right? So if you remember, so we said we can compute the diameter in time n plus some polynomial in 1 over epsilon. And in fact, if you, uh, I presented a weaker version of this class, but in two dimensions, you can do something like n plus O of 1 over epsilon squared in two dimensions. And this 2 is not a coincidence that 1 over epsilon squared came directly from the fact that you were building some kind of two-dimensional grid. And it's not hard to see that if you had to generalize this to higher dimensions, you might end up with something that looks like this. Again, it's not obvious, but you can play with this. It could be even worse than this for certain problems. At any rate, you're going to have something of the form, and maybe I'll write this differently just to emphasize that you know, there are different ways in which this could happen. So you have reduced your dependence on n, so your base of your exponent is now not n, which is something, but it's still d. And if epsilon is something like, you know, I don't know, 0.1, you know, 10% error, <coughs> then you're basically asking for something like 10 to the d, which is not great, if d is 100. So while <coughs> our solution last time for doing diameter was helpful to reduce dependency on n, it did nothing for the dependency on d, because you were building these structures that fundamentally kept growing exponentially with the dimension, a simple grid. And in fact, again, if you 
take a class in geometry, you will realize that grids are things that are very useful for low dimension problems. They're not very good for high dimension problems. And so uh, fundamentally what you want to do is reduce the intrinsic dimensionality of your question. Yes, you have 100 features. Maybe they're not all interesting. Maybe to solve the problem you want to solve, you only need 10 of them. And so instead of compressing, so if you think of your data matrix now, as I was referring to earlier, so if you think of a data matrix as, you know, I have a, I have a set of points, there are n points, and each point has d features. Compressing this is, you know, so you're building corsets, right? Or sketches. That's one way to compress. But if you want to compress this way, you're doing what is called dimensionality reduction. And the purpose in both cases is the same. Get the size of the data down without losing what is essential about your problem. Right? You are losing information, but for any particular problem, maybe it's okay. Because for that problem, maybe you can do with the less data. Maybe you can do less. And of course, these things are often orthogonal, right? If you can do one, you can do the other. You can do them both. And often you can do exactly both of them, and they don't interact, and so you can get benefits from doing both things. Sometimes that's not always true. But yeah, these are, you can think of it as two separate ways you can try to reduce data complexity to make your problem easier to solve, to reduce the cursor dimensional data. Okay? All right, any questions before I go? So this is the sort of the, the, the stage has been now set to describe some actual methods for doing this. Some of which you may have seen in machine learning or in data mining or will. But uh, I want to focus on these sort of the algorithms of doing this thing. So are there any questions before I go on why we're doing this and what, what we want to do here? Big question is <clears throat> the first approach I'm going to talk about. Something that you may have heard about, at least you've heard the name. Okay. I will present two different ways of thinking about this problem. Uh, they, they're sort of different in the kind of expectations they have from the data and the problem. And I'll try to pull that out a little bit. When we talk about it. So, if we believe that we can, in fact, reduce the dimensionality of our data without losing something essential that we want to find, we are making an assumption about whatever we think the data looks like. And this is very important. You can think of it as an assumption out of necessity. Well, if it doesn't look like that, we're dead anyway. Or you can think of an assumption out of modeling. Well, we, I don't believe that, there is, that these 100 features are all independent of each other. That they're all, they, they must be all correlated in some way, and there are only a few that are really independent. And the question is, how do you make that statement more precise, and how can you then extract that structure that you believe is the independent structure in your data? So to do that, it's helpful to sort of keep a picture in your mind. So suppose I have a data set, and let's say it's two-dimensional for now, because I can explain this in two dimensions. So I have some and I have a bunch of points. I'm sampling some dependency of some variable on some other. You know, maybe the independent variable is um, uh, Take your favorite, uh, someone give me an example of a good X and Y for regression. Any volunteers? Some kind of thing where you might expect some kind of pseudo linear dependency with noise. So, an example that would not work is time spent on homework and grade and homework, right? That, as we know, it's not linear. But, but something else that is might be sort of kind of linear. Any examples? Anyone? Yeah? Pirates versus cell phones. Sorry? Pirates versus cell phones. Pirates? Versus cell phones. 
Wait, what do you mean pirates? The number of pirates in the world per year? Per year. Per year. Okay. It turns out to be almost like that. Which way though? Uh, Sorry? So as more cell phones get, uh, as you add more cell phones, you decrease the number of pirates. Um, Is this like piracy or like the people that? The, the people who are like, like the siege You mean like Jack Sparrow type pirates? Blackbeard? Not, 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 uh, okay, I see. Okay. No, no, no. Consider software pirates. Oh, okay, okay. All right. So pirates versus cell phones. This is not a correlation expected, but it's a good one. So, so let's see. Let's draw a very old style cell with an antenna. Okay. So you've been. Collecting data every year on the number of cell phones in the world versus number of pirates. This is a, I'm not sure how you did it, but you did somehow. And uh, you know, you plot your things with time over the course of the. Of, well, oh, sorry, it's the other way. How do you get my? Maybe data looks like this, right? And of course, if you look at this, oh, okay, there's a general trend, and I can find this trend, and you know. I can say something like this. <coughs> Essentially what regression does for you. But what you're also seeing is that, you know, that even though your data consists of two points, so each point is, you know, let's say um, cell phone and pirate, number of pirates, you have a whole bunch of points like this. And they look like it's a bunch of points, two dimensions. There's really only one dimension that matters. Some kind of functional relationship between pirates and cell phones. So, you know, so number of pirates <coughs> plus, you know, uh, alpha one times number of pirates plus alpha two times number of cell phones equals to some constant, right? So there's some kind of dependency among these things. So there's really only a one dimensional system, even though it's got two points in it. Because once I have one, I can find the other. In other words, I would like to discover this so I can reduce the dimensionality of this data set by keeping only the cell phone information around and knowing I can derive the other one with some noise from it. Right? So this is your classic sort of setup where you have, and you, you should think of this in higher dimensions now, where you have a whole bunch of points in a space, but there's some kind of lower dimensional structure that goes through here. Okay? And you want to preserve the fidelity of your data as much as possible. Right? So for example, if I had a data set, so let me sort of draw a, another example of a different data set. If I had a data set that looked like this, would I believe that the x coordinate of each point carries useful information? In other words, if I projected all my points down to the x-axis, right? What I would get is a very narrow range of variation here. If I project it to the y-axis, what I get is a very wide variation of range. In terms of informativeness, would you prefer X or Y projections? If I had to choose between one of those two. But why? No, seriously. Why would you choose Y? <laughs> Be yes? Because it covers most of the variation in data. Why is that a good thing? Because, uh, so if I have a sample, I want to be find if it, it belongs to this data set, then I want to cover, I want to check it with respect to maximum variation. Plus minus like sigma. For example, there's a Gaussian distribution over there. But I can do that even in the x case, right? I can still build a distribution. You know, do it. Why is that a problem? So it would be a very narrow distribution. I mean, my chances of generality are very less. But isn't it good if it's narrow? Then I got you know like a nice concentrated. It depends on application. Sure, it does. But in general, if you're saying I want to capture the the, the diversity of the data, and you imagine projecting everything down. To, it's like saying that if I have a bunch of numbers, right, that are between, um, 
Let's see. If I have a bunch of numbers that are between 0 and 1, and they all vary in the second decimal place, so they're all of the form 0 0.01, 0 0.02, 0 .02, and I only keep one decimal place of information, I'm going to lose all the variation that actually is in the data. So one way of thinking about this. Another way of saying is that you know, there is some true natural variation. There's a way to identify different elements. There's some, there's some uh, fidelity and resolution at which I can see what's going on in the data. If I project down to the x, I've collapsed everything. I've lost all that information. If I project on the y, I've kept as much information as possible. So in these two examples, I want to project on the y because I believe that the y direction captures most of the variation in the data. So it preserves most of the information in the data. Of course, in general, you won't have a nice data set where it's either x or y. You have something much more general. But the principle remains the same, that what you're looking for is to find a way to maximize the variation in this data. Okay. So let's think about that for a second. So I have a point. So let's try to measure what we believe as, as variance as some kind of squared norm. Right? So if you, you want squared norm because if things go further out, the squared norm increases. So you want to maximize that quantity. So, so let's try to be more precise about this. So, um, So let's say I have a point. I have a point x, so not x coordinate, but some point x, and I have some direction. So you can think of as you can think of uh, maximizing as some kind of direction, right? So you're looking along a certain direction, and you want to maximize along a direction. Well, if you project a point onto a direction, right? So if you have a direction here. You, when you have a point here, x, and you could say, okay, well, how much of x's value can be measured if I project it onto u? Well, we know what that is going to be. That's going to be basically x transpose u. Right? And if we want to maximize the sum of the squares of these things, we might say, okay, do maximize the sum for i equal to 1 to n x transpose u whole squared. So I have a bunch of points, I have a single direction, and I want to find the direction that best captures the information in the data. So I want to do something like this. Okay. And this can be rewritten as something like So we can rewrite this expression. We can, we can collect all these things out here into a single matrix. We'll call it C. So we're saying that we want to maximize U, um, uh, U transpose CU, where C is equal to sum of I equal to 1 to N, XI, XI transpose. So C is a matrix. And Without also generality, we can assume that u is just a direction, in other words, a unit vector. So I'm going to add the constraint. Okay, so it's really a direction you're looking. You're looking for the right direction to maximize. So, so if you remember your linear algebra, there's a well-defined answer to this question. If I have a matrix and I want to maximize this quantity, what is the u that will maximize? So what, what is the, the thing, this is actually, there's a, there's, a, there's a property of a matrix that is defined this way. <clears throat> Sorry? Uh, no, because C, well, it, well, it turns out that so as so happens, C will be, but that's not what I'm talking about. Then what, what about the U itself? Yeah? You want to say something? 
So if you have a matrix, you want to maximize this. What is the thing that you get? Why? Because, as you know, if, if, a, if u is an eigenvector of c, then c times u is equal to lambda times u, where lambda is the associated eigenvalue. And so the value of this quantity for any eigenvector, so if, uh, so let's say the pair is u lambda, then u transpose c u is going to be what? It's going to be lambda, because u is a mod 1. Because c u is going to be lambda times u, u transpose u is 1, you get lambda. So obviously the largest way to, the way to get this the largest possible is to choose the one that gives you the maximum lambda, which is the largest eigenvalue. Okay? So the direction that maximizes this value, this projection value, is the largest eigenvalue of this matrix, which if your vectors are centered, that means their mean is zero, is called the covariance matrix, or the empirical covariance matrix of the data. And essentially what that does is, it picks off the first direction of importance. So that direction u that you get will be the direction along which you have maximum variance. Now eigenvectors form a basis, so they form an orthogonal basis. So the next one you get, after you've, take, after you've subtracted this away essentially, is going to be the eigenvector that's orthogonal to this, which has the next maximum variance. So what you're going to end up with is if you have a data set Let's say it looks like this. So I'm going to draw another data set and I'm going to. So it looks like this. The first eigenvector, the first u you're going to pull off that um, you get is going to look like this. You get to be able to sign you attached to one or the other. And the next one you're going to pull off is going to look like this. And essentially, so what you've done is you've taken your data, you've rotated it and stretched it out so that the coordinates corresponding to the direction of maximum variance, the direction of second maximum variance, are orthogonal and independent of each other. You've essentially isolated the independent components of the variation in the data. So in general, what you have to do is you don't you, know, you don't necessarily do this one by one. So what you, the process you take is that you you center the data. So make sure it's zero mean in every coordinate. Um, compute the empirical covariance matrix. Okay, and let it compute its eigenvalues. Compute say compute. Top k eigenvalue eigenvectors. When I say top k eigenvectors, I mean that eigenvectors corresponding to top k eigenvalues. Okay? Those directions now, so let's call them u1 through uk. And now the new coordinate, so my old point had you know b coordinates in it for some large number d. My new coordinate, so I, if I have a point i and I want the a jth coordinate of the new point i, so y i j is basically going to be x i transpose u j. So I take the product, the, uh, I project the ith point onto the jth direction to get the jth coordinate of that point. Notice now that I've gone from, this is a mapping from R d to R k. And k could be 1. I mean, I may not get as much information I'd like, but k could be 1, k could be 2, k could be 3. I can choose k to be whatever I want, and I'll get as much information as possible. In fact, you can show that this particular procedure gives you essentially the maximum amount of information in a formal sense. 
And that's not surprising because that's exactly what we're trying to maximize the amount of error, amount of information we project onto the line versus how much we use. Yes? Is there always little to no correlation in the data? Like yes. You just have to indicate that's, I guess, kind of close to D to get some kind of accurate. That's right. So what, you, what you're going to look at is you're going to say, okay, how much of the information in my data, right, in my X, how much of the information goes on the first dimension, how much goes on the second dimension, how much goes on the third dimension? So let's take a particular point. I'll get to your question in a second. Okay, so, so um, let's take a particular point, x, and let's plot its energy. So in other words, let's let's say that um, uh, sigma j is equal to x transpose u j squared. Okay, and let's plot this. So so we have j on this direction, and we have the sigma j on this direction. If your data is relatively uncorrelated. You're not seeing any patterns. The kind of thing you're going to see might be something like this. So there'll be some decrease across the dimensions, but it's not very much. If you have a strong pattern in your data, right, then what you're going to see instead, so this is a no pattern. If you have a set of strong pattern, you're going to see something like this. Okay. And what that means is that if you want to capture the essential amount of information in your data and you're willing to tolerate a little bit of loss, in the second case, you could cut off your J somewhere here. You could just take these first four coordinates, and you've now got pretty much all the information you care about, modulus of small, modulus of small noise. In the first case, you have to go really far down the line to get anything, to get anything useful. So if your data does admit a low dimensional structure, sorry, you will be able to find it using this method, PCA. Because you can inspect, you can essentially do the PCA, <coughs> look at these projections and see, OK, am I getting a strong data? And for a lot of data sets, you can And that will say, okay, now we can choose the right value of k to express, to capture what's going on here. Okay? And of course, there's a lot of, uh, you know, I wouldn't say science, a lot of sort of mystery about choosing the right value of k. This is a separate question. For example, you might want to plot the data on a, on a piece of paper. So k better be 2. Or you might want to visualize it on a screen. Maybe k can be 3 then. Sometimes you don't care what k is as long as it's small. Let's say it's less than 10. So you pick 10. Or you look at your data and it just drops off after 15. Okay, pick 15. It's still better than 100. There are many ways you could decide what value you to pick. The point is that this process makes sure that whatever you want to do, you will get the, you will pick off the dimensions in the right order. It will find the dimensions in the right order so that you will get as much in. It's something like transforming your data so that greedy will work, essentially. If you didn't do this, it just took the first quarter, the second quarter, and we saw, an, we saw an example where that would be a wrong thing to do. Where you should have picked the second one, not the first one. X did not work for Y would. But once you transform the data this way, you're guaranteed that if you go in decreasing order of eigenvalues, you'll always pick the best one first and the best one next. Okay, so you had a question. Right, so um, you mentioned about machine learning, how this can be helpful, but often in machine learning, or even in other practical situations, your feature set are not necessarily in the same... Um, Range? Yeah, or you could say something like that. So like one is temperature and the other one is speed and the right. other one, and so they're not on the same scale if you were. As a practical matter, if you have to do PCA with that kind of data, you have you one thing you do is you basically set each dimension independently to have unit variance. So you rescale each coordinate so that it has unit variance. So that puts everything in the same ballpark. If you think of what's going on in PCA, if you think of the mapping that PCA is giving to you, what it's doing is it's taking your unit ball. Okay, so if you think, okay, so, so what's going on? You saw, I said you rotate, you stretch, okay? If you take a unit ball, so things at distance one, you rotate it, nothing happens. But then you stretch it. You go from a circle to an ellipse, and then you rotate it back. That's really what's happening. You're trying to find these coordinates. In your example, you're doing a pre-stretching already. So it can be wrapped into this whole process. And that's what you typically have to do if you have data at a different scale. If you have data of a different type, then the problem gets uniform. But if you have numerical data, you first you can you can read first you center them and then you make them uh, zero uh, mean uh, unit variance and then you run. Them.
then we can also be other features that are Boolean, for example. Yeah, then you have problems. Yeah, and so this kind of heterogeneous data analysis is a big problem. So uh, this is not going to solve all your problems, but this is a way to think about how to reduce dimensionality in this special case when you have essentially numeric data. Right? There are other things you can do if you have uh, data, but I'm not going to get that. Yes? Capital X is all, well, all set of points. Right? This is one point. That's X is a single point. I'm saying look at the, look at the energy, look, take any point, right? And look at how it's energy gets distributed along the different dimensions you particular. Okay. So there's, there'll be one of these lines for each point. Right. So, so the essentially PC loadings for a vector also decay as? Well, you hope so that you, if they decay well, then your PC is likely to be effective. Then you can reduce dimensionality and keep the essential information in your data. If your thing does not decay, then you're not getting a good signal of it. So this pattern, is it always similar to the curve of lambda? Lambda with respect to um, eigenvalues? Because they're also we see it. On average, yeah. We take all these curves and average them together. That's what the lambda curves are. Yeah. Because yeah, yeah. that's the curve of the entire set. Yes. Yeah. So when the order of the data being expected is the underlying application is just using the query of the data? It depends. It depends on what you're using. Yeah. That this is where a lot of the data preparation aspects of doing data mining come into play, where you have to be aware, do you want to do this? How do you do this? How do you take care of certain kinds of features? How do you scale the features? Do you want to do univariates? Do you not? Maybe it's important. No. These are all decisions that, that the, the user has to make, or the, the person who's preparing the data has to make. I'm saying once you have all that taken care of, then there is a conceptual way to think about what it means to do this. But you have to do this. Okay? So, yes. So I see that this can reduce dimensionality, but that's only really good if PCA, computing PCA is easy in some sense, and it doesn't solve the first dimension. So my question is, uh, how hard is it to compute PCA? Very good question. To compute PCA, you have to take this matrix and compute its eigenspectrum. There are many horrible ways to do that. There are many less horrible ways to do that. In fact, there's a gigantic body of research on given a matrix A, so given Oops. So given some matrix A, compute um, uh, the eigenspectrum. That means eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Um, to do this exactly is expensive. It takes like NQ time, which is not that great. I think how do you know better than I would? But in, in parallel, you can do these things you know, reasonably well. You can also approximate them. You can do all these nice randomized methods. So one simple method to compute the max eigenvector, take a vector at random, multiply it by a matrix. That gets a new vector, multiply by a matrix, get a new vector, keep it, it's called the power method. You can show the power method, if the largest eigenvalue is sufficiently bigger than the next biggest one, this will converge to the largest eigenvalue. And you can subtract it off and start again. So there are ways to do this. Where you, if you were just on the top K, and your <coughs> matrix is much bigger, then this is actually a big win for you. Because you just, if you're on three eigenvectors, you can just do this one by one. So there are many, there's a large body of work. In fact, Jeff teaches a class called Matrix Sketching, where the whole class is about how to do these kinds of things. So the, I can't really capture the breadth and depth of this area in a few minutes. But, but yes, there is a lot of study of that. And that, this is exactly why. Because you want to do things like this. Have, have any of you taken Jeff's Matrix Sketching class? A couple of you? Just a few of you. There was a question back there somewhere. Was that one? Yes. What if your data tends to have like, a, so let's say it looked like a parabola? Yep. Would that, would PCA work for this, I guess? I, I guess I'm just wondering like, how do you, uh, uh, Well, if your data, okay, so if your data looked like, um, <coughs> so let's say you have data. <coughs> Looks like this. Yeah. Then the direction of maximum variance is going to be the x-axis. So we'll pick off that direction first. Depending on how you draw the parabola, the direction of the next variance will be probably the y-axis. And so, it, it, yeah. So, you you should be able to get some information. Yeah, but it would be a very effective PCA. Would it be because it may not be first first variance value in itself would be like 0.5 or 0.6. Yeah. Sort of. The problem is that PCA is very good when there is what you expect to be linear structure in the data. 
because all your transformation is linear. If you're scaling and stretching, it's still a linear transformation. If your data has got intrinsically curved structure like this, you need to look for other methods. So, you know, there are things called kernel PCA. People, some people argue that what autoencoders do in deep learning is a kind of nonlinear PCA. So there are different ways you, but the, the concept is the same. You're trying to extract the dimensions of maximum inform, informativeness in terms of variance, but how you extract them can be using linear methods or using nonlinear methods or so on. Right? PCA is a particular linear form of doing this, which is quite effective, but they could be like a few. So, these are all about reducing the dimensionality, but are there any sort of guidelines as to what dimensionality is feasible to compute uh, with? For different problems, it depends. So for example, one of the most basic questions people look at is nearest neighbor search. I have a query point, let's say it's an image or some piece of text, and I have a database of these things. I want to find the item in the database that is closest to the query I'm asking. It's a very standard, any search query you can think of it as a standard question. And as a rule of thumb, there is a divide going from something like below five dimensions. So there's, there's techniques that work very well if you're like five or six dimensions or less. You can use grids and clever grids and things work out well. There are techniques that work pretty well once you're above you know, 50 that work very differently. In the middle, it depends. So for each problem, there is some kind of rule of thumb and some prior art and some folk knowledge about what works. But it's hard to be very rigorous because data sets can be so different and different data sets can happen. But there is some sense of it. Uh, same thing for things like classifiers, building classifiers for data. There's some, you know, most of the time when you believe classifiers, you're working in a very high dimension space, then you don't really have a low dimension problem. But sometimes if you just have a linear problem, you can do something more specific just for that. So all this is great if you believe your data has an intrinsic low dimensional structure. And if it does, great. If it doesn't, well, not so great. The next thing I want to tell you about, and in fact, um, let's take a two minute break. But the next thing I'm going to tell you about after the break is the, the surprising and very shocking fact that no matter what your data looks like, there is an intrinsic low dimension structure to it, no matter how many dimensions it looks like. And so, yeah. we'll tell you this in about three minutes.
There's really only three dimensions that could independent dimensions that control what's happening with data. And all the other ones are a function of those three independent dimensions. And so you go looking for it and then you find it if it's there. And there are ways to check if it's actually there or not. For example, if you didn't have a structure, you wouldn't see this decay in the, in the eigenvalues and you would know, okay, this data does not seem to admit a good uh, low dimensional linear representation. And so at that point you might think, well, I'm stuck then. If my data doesn't have anything, I can't do anything. But it turns out that at a very different level of reasoning, right? If you're talking about, so you can think of SVD as, uh, the PCA as saying, look, I really have a budget. I have five dimensions. I can't work with anything more than five. Give me the best representation of the data that you can that uses five dimensions. This is the problem that PCA solves for you. It says, okay, you have five dimensions. You take these five dimensions. That I guarantee you will be the best. And it is. The best may not be that good, but it's still the best. Of all possible ways of re reducing your data to five dimensions, that's going to be the best one. But if I flip the question around and I said, no, 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 my budget is not about the dimensionality. It's about the error. I want to have a really high quality representation of my data. How far down can you push it while keeping that high quality representation? This is a little different question now. Because it may be that for one data set, I can't push it down very much. I don't like to push it down a lot more. There will be huge variations. So, you, so the, hopefully you see the difference in these two questions. Right? One is when your budget is in dimensions. One is when your budget is in error. And they lead to different situations. And what is surprising and has had huge impact in all of the analysis is the fact that I'm going to tell you right now that no matter where your data lives, what dimension it lives in, you can push it down to a lower dimensional representation that only depends essentially on the error and on the number of points in the set. It does not depend on where it started. So this result is called, um, it's a, it's, you know, ironically given how important this is, it's still called a lemma because it was proved as you know, another paper. It's what's called the, it's, I mean it's so ubiquitous that I think it's just good to remember the name of it. It's called the Johnson Linden Strauss. Often called the GL lemma for short, because it's just too long to say. It's like no one sees my name. So, what does it say? It says the following. So you're given n points, um, p1 through pn, okay. some parameter epsilon. Think of this as an error parameter. There exists in, 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 in Euclidean space. So these are all in some Euclidean space, which means that you measure distance by taking the sum of the square and taking the square root. I'm not telling you the dimensional spaces. They don't matter. So there are some points in the Euclidean space. There exists a mapping, in fact, a linear mapping. Okay, so let's call this set P. Um, 
such that the property of this mapping is going to be that all distances are approximately preserved. Okay. So in other words, we can say something like this. The distance between two points, pi and pj, is, and I'm going to put 1 plus epsilon times that. So you think of a range from the actual value to something slightly bigger. That's where the distance And D, the, the target dimension, okay, but before we, you know, let's just, whenever you're trying to read a, and this goes for your project as well, trying to read something that looks really complicated like this, don't go looking at the proof, let's try to stare at this for a bit and see what it's trying to say. What we're saying is that if we, if we, if we take a bunch of points, there are endpoints in some dimensional space, I don't care what. There is a mapping which can be expressed and uh, written it sort of carelessly this way as a matrix. In fact, it's a linear mapping, not just any mapping, it's a linear function. Such that if I looked at the target, so I take the mapping, I apply to the point. So the mapping, so the map of pi will be a times pi. So pi gets projected down to some a times pi, q of pj gets projected down to a times pj. So if I look at the original distance, Right. And I now map the points, and I look at this distance, it doesn't change very much. In other words, it's between the original distance and something slightly bigger. So when I take these two points, and I map them, they maybe move a little bit, but not much. And I can control how much. And the number of dimensions needed okay, to fit these points in depends only on the error term and the number of points. In fact, the log n, if you look at the proofs of the statement, is just due to a turn off. You prove something for a particular pair. Now it has to be true for all n choose two pairs. So you have to repeat this. So you just amplify it by a factor of log n. And if you have your turn off one being in your memory, you know that that is all you need. Because it's log of n squared as well. So really the error is going to be, the dimensions are going to be 1 over epsilon squared for a particular pair. So let's first try to understand what is surprising about this. The first surprising thing is that the source dimensionality does not matter. The points could be in three dimensions, in which case this may not make any sense. The points could be in a gazillion dimensions. It still doesn't matter. It still works the same way. The next surprising thing is that you see this log n. And here's why it's surprising. There is another way to think about what's going on here. Another way to think about this is that because of this linearity property, because a times pi, uh, well, you can rewrite this expression. So you can rewrite this expression as right, because linear. Another way of saying this is that of another expression, an equivalent expression of the GL lemma is that if x is equal to 1 if it's a unit vector, then Ax is less than or equal to 1 plus epsilon. So the norm of any vector does not change very much in a multiplicative sense. Okay. This is an equivalent formulation of what I set up there, and this follows from linearity. In other words, unit vectors stay more or less unit vectors. Another way of saying this is that you can and this is where it gets surprising as well. Let me ask you the following question. If I have a d-dimensional space, okay, how many vectors can I put in there that are all perpendicular to each other? D, right? Okay. Suppose I say, well, perpendicular means the cosine of the angle between them is zero. Suppose I allow the cosine to be epsilon. So it's not zero, but it's, you know, so they're basically like they're almost 90, but they're just a little bit off. And then I ask you the same question. How many can you put? The JL lemma says, this is kind of, you have to mentally flip this around because D is log n and n is 2 to the D. 
that if you have vectors that are almost orthogonal, but not exactly orthogonal, you can fit in two to the d such vectors in your space, rather than d. So allowing a slight wiggle in the, in the, in the orthogonality gives you, in some sense, way more room to pack to it, which is a very bizarre kind of thing. So there are a couple of things that are very surprising about this fact. The fact that target dimension, the source dimension doesn't matter, the fact that target dimension is long end. And it's basically saying that if you have endpoints, the intrinsic dimensionality, the dimensionality that captures all the distance information among the points, not everything, the distance information is only log n. And you might say, well, log n is pretty big. But if you have something that runs in time 2 to the d, and d is log n, you now have a problem with that algorithm. Whereas if d was arbitrarily large, this could be terrible. And that's where the GL lemma has become very useful. That what it says is that you can take your data and project it down to a much lower dimensional space, which depends only on n, where your structure is more or less preserved. And this statement is so powerful that it has had you know, 15 different proofs, all using different, it touches on many, you know, there's a one way of looking at the GL level as a glorified Chernoff form. There's another way of looking at it as a slicing of convex, but there's a polytopes, there's a number of different ways of thinking about what's going on here. It's a very, it's, it's a statement that is, looks very simple, but carries deep, deep thoughts inside it. That as you study it more and more, you realize more and more where it's coming from. And, um, now, of course, the question, I mean, apart from how to prove this, right, the question is, well, what does this transformation look like? And that's the coolest part of the whole thing. This transformation is incredibly simple. Let me give you, there are many, many ways of doing this, but let me give you one example. So what does A look like? One second. Yeah, you had a question? So it's not just group to the small d, it should also depend on the error of Yes, yes, yes. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, yes. There's, there's a one of thoughts about term. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. That's, why, that's why the cosine is epsilon, right? Yes. Depending on the epsilon, the, the packing will, will change, but the 2 to the d part will not change. So because just look at two dimensions. Yeah. So we have two vectors, and from 90 degree, we make it 89 degrees. Yeah. So we cannot treat this more than. Um, yes, yes, but, uh, but you know, these are all yeah, const they're constants hidden, yeah. right? So you have to, you know, in, in, a, in the limit, you know, things get very large as well. Yes. So, uh, yeah, any question? So, um, this preserves distances. Are there other properties that other things preserve that are similarly uh, efficient, such as, like, direction of vector between points? Yes. So, good. So, I said distances are preserved. Let's, so you, you can think of distance as a special case of area. Right? If you have two points, they have defined a distance, which is a one-dimensional area. If you have three points, they have a two-dimensional area. If you have four points, they have a three-dimensional area, which we call a volume, and so on and so forth. Right? So you can think of distance as a special case of that. You can now say, well, I want to preserve the volume of all k-dimensional simplices. It still works. And instead of log n over epsilon squared, it becomes k log n over epsilon squared. Because essentially you have n to the k different things whose properties you want to preserve. Apply turn off on, log of n to the k, you get k log n. So yes, you can do that. If you want to preserve directionality, I already alluded to that in the sense that you have these unit, ve unit norm vectors. And essentially you're saying that the distances, the angles in them are roughly preserved. But that's not exactly the same as this. There's some technical details of how you say that. You have a question? Huh? Um, so for this vector formulation, um, do yeah. you need Ax to be greater than 1? Yeah, yeah. so I, I should have said um, that that always holds. Um, yeah. So it's always sandwiched between the value and I mean, So you can think yeah. of this as happening either on one side or on the other side. It doesn't really matter because by scaling you. You have like the, the two bands on the Right, so it's the exact same thing. Okay, so what does it look like? I can describe it to you very simply. So I have my data in some high dimensional space, <laughs> let's say it's in D dimension, D is very large, and I want to project it into these log n over epsilon squared dimensions. Here's what I do. I take my point, I, I fix 
a random rotation of the space. So what's a random rotation? Well, in two dimensions, you can think of a random rotation as a point of a circle. Three dimensions, you can think of it as some kind of normal to a sphere. Right? So there's some kind of random rotation you can do in a space. So take a point set, do a random rotation, take the first k coordinates, or k, first d coordinates, done. It's not a matrix, but you can, I can describe it that way. So the easiest, the, the original proof of the, um, of the uh, JL lemma said, find a random d-dimensional subspace. Okay? In 2D, that would be like saying, find a random line. And this works as a proof. It's a little inconvenient to work with this because computing a random d-dimensional subspace can be a little tricky. There's an even easier way to do this. A equals to, so it's a collection of Aij, where each Aij is drawn from a normal with zero mean and univariance. So this is very shocking in some ways, right? Because this matrix has nothing to do with your data. It doesn't matter what your data looks like. It doesn't matter how the points are distributed. Nothing matters. You can compute this matrix ahead of time. And it works. Each item is Gaussian. And if you are wondering why that is, a Gaussian is isotropic. In other words, a Gaussian distribution has many nice properties. First of all, it's symmetric, especially unit normal. And the projection of any Gaussian is a Gaussian. So if you take a Gaussian in two dimensions, which is kind of like a big blob, and you cut it, what you see in your cut plane is also a Gaussian. Essentially, what you're doing with choosing this Gaussian is simulating choosing a random rotation. But it's much easier to do it. You can do it locally. Every coordinate, like coordinate, so I'm going to do some global. Thing. In fact, this is often a way people compute a random rotation. You take a Gaussian matrix, and you compute its um, uh, uh, LR decomposition and take one side and that gives you the matrix. I digress. So this is a very simple way of doing this. You can do something even simpler. You can say that, you know, this matrix is very dense and for a lot of operations you don't want a dense matrix. You can make this sparse. You can say that, you know, um, Aij is equal to zero with probability um, two over three and it's equal to plus one with probability one sixth it's equal to minus one with probability one sixth, and even that's good enough. So you can nuke out two thirds of the entries in your matrix, and you can just use plus one and minus one. It's not even a Gaussian; it still works. In fact, there is a gigantic class of distributions called sub-Gaussian distributions. As long as you pick from one of them, this works. It's a very, very robust method. All it relies on is essentially the same phenomenon that we see with Chernock calls, something called the concentration of measure, that things tend to concentrate. Okay. You can make this even better. You can think of this as you can build a random hash function. And there's a, there's a huge body of work on how to do this very, very efficiently. And so I won't get that. That's, again, a whole other class by itself that you can spend just looking at methods for doing the GL transform. But the, the fact remains that you know you can compute this matrix obliviously. It's independent of the data. It's <coughs> randomized. You can actually make it deterministic, but it takes a lot of work. Uh, there's there's some construction that basically involves error correcting codes, and you can make them deterministic. And it gives you this cool property. And it'll be hard. It'll be hard for me to overstate the importance this result has had in the field of I guess, geometry, algorithms, and large data analysis. The, the the fingerprints of this lemma are everywhere when you think of dealing with kernels and doing projection on kernels, when you do anything with compressed sensing. You may have heard of compressed sensing. It's a way to sort of uh, take a few measurements and try to reconstruct a signal. This shows up there. Um, uh, all kinds of data analysis problems. You know, and um, it just, the, the list just sort of goes on and on. And so that, the, the, the fact that this is true is again very shocking. And yet it is. So there's this bizarre low dimensional structure data that you can always find. And what this often means is that if you have some problem, which is very high dimensional, very hard to solve, you can solve it by compressing it down to this log n dimensional space, running some more expensive algorithm that takes time exponential in D, some constant to the D. But because of this, it becomes not problem. So for example, if you have an algorithm, suppose you have an algorithm that takes time, 
they then fall in and to do the deed. So let's say you have some algorithm here on some data. If you apply the GL lemma first, it's not going to take time poly and n and 2 to the log n over epsilon squared, which is going to be some poly and n times n to the 1 over epsilon squared, which is another polynomial. So you've just created a polynomial time algorithm by the fact that you can apply this lemma. This doesn't always work. For a lot of problems, you don't have the luxury of having just 2 to the d, sometimes it's the n to the d, in which case it won't work. But it works here, in this case of grids I was talking about, these kind of things. So it's like a good hammer you can just apply. Okay, bring the dimension down. It's also a helpful way of thinking about data, right? That there's intrinsic only login dimensions you care about. So you have lots and lots of features. If you have a million points and you have more than 20 features, you're probably not going to need all of them. <coughs> That's, again, a good ballpark way of thinking about it. So there are constants involved, but that gives you a sense of what your data, if you have, if you have a million points and a million dimensions, your problem is over specified. You don't need all that. It's unlikely you're going to use it. So it gives you a guideline to think about when you need more structure, when you expect to see more structured data. Questions? Okay, so we have assignment due tomorrow. Um, there will be one more assignment, like I mentioned, which will be kind of a, a somewhat light uh, stroll, if you wish, through linear programming. A pleasant stroll, flowers to pick. Uh, and that'll be it.